In 2004, Boeing's Dreamliner set the industry ablaze with promises of 20% fuel savings. Airbus panicked, airlines scoffed at their rushed answer, and the A350-800 to collapsed from 182 orders to just 16. But Airbus did not quit. They played a different game. The A330neo was not built to win the sales race. It was designed to keep Airbus alive, while forcing Boeing to fight on price and to delay its next big idea. So how did a backup plane that nobody wanted become the most underestimated chess move in aerospace? The truth starts with a shockwave and a gamble. Boeing's announcement of the 787 Dreamliner in 2004 sent a jolt through the aviation world. The promise was bold, a wide-body jet built with carbon composites, delivering 20% better fuel efficiency than anything flying. Airlines and lessors did not just notice, they demanded answers. Airbus scrambled for a response, but their first move fell flat. Instead of a new design, they offered the old A330 with new engines and a carbon wing. For the industry's biggest buyers, that was not nearly enough. ILFC and Gaecas, the two most powerful lessers at the time, dismissed the idea outright. One analyst quipped that suggesting a metal plane with new engines was grounds for being thrown out of the boardroom. Airlines wanted a leap, not a retread. Boeing's Dreamliner had set a new standard, and orders poured in. Airbus, facing rejection from the very customers it needed, was forced back to the drawing board. The message from the market was clear. The era of incremental upgrades was over. Only something truly new would do. The stakes were not just about fuel burn or range. They were about survival in a market that had moved on overnight. The A350 family was supposed to be Airbus's answer to Boeing's widebody lead, a trio of jets designed to cover every corner of the market. The smallest, the A350 Sons 800, had a clear job replace the aging A330-200 and go head-to-head -head with the 787-8. On paper, it looked like a smart bet. In 2008, airlines placed 182 orders for the A350-800, a sign of early confidence. But that confidence did not last. Airbus made a critical decision. Instead of building a true small jet, they simply shrank the larger A350-900, to that shortcut added weight and hurt fuel burn. Airlines noticed. By 2010, the A350 Saint 800 was relegated to third place in the production line, behind the A350s to 900 and the even bigger A350 1000. Suddenly, customers who wanted new planes faced longer waits and worse economics. Major buyers, US Airways, Aeroflot and Asiana quietly switched their orders to bigger models. The order book bled away, dropping from 182 to just 16 by 2014. For Airbus, the optics were brutal. Years of investment had produced a jet nobody wanted. At the Farnborough Air Show that July 2014, CEO Fabrice Bregier made it official. He told reporters, I believe all of our customers will either convert to the A350-900 or the A330-NEO. In that moment, the gap in Airbus's lineup was exposed. The smallest A350 was gone, and the company needed a new answer fast. Farnborough, July 14th, 2014. On a stage crowded with reporters, Airbus CEO Fabrice Bregier made two announcements that could not have been more different in spirit. First, the A350-800 was officially dead. There would be no more development and no more promises. In its place came the A330neo, a jet that Airbus had once dismissed as too conservative, now reborn as their answer to a suddenly glaring gap in the lineup. The pitch was blunt, a proven airframe, the latest Rolls-Royce Trent 7000 engines, 14% better fuel burn per seat, and a sticker price far below anything Boeing could match. Development would cost just $2 billion, pocket change compared to the 787's $25 billion saga. Tony Fernandez at AirAsia X, who had lobbied for a re-engined A330 since 2010, 
was first to praise the move, calling it the perfect fit for his long-haul budget ambitions. But the wider industry was not convinced. Boeing Vice Chairman Ray Connor wasted no time and dismissed the A300 PNEO as a 2004 revamp that could not touch the 787's operating costs, weighed down by nine extra tons, and a wing rooted in the 1980s. For Airbus, though, the calculus was different. This was not about winning a beauty contest. It was about keeping the production lines running, giving airlines a near-term option, and buying time while the A350 ramped up. The A330 Neo was not born to dazzle. It was built to survive, and maybe, just maybe, to change the game by simply refusing to leave the board. Hawaiian Airlines became the only believer in the A330-800 when Airbus needed a public vote of confidence. After the A350-800 was scrapped, Hawaiian's order for six jets was quietly shifted to the smaller A330neo. For a while, that made Hawaiian the sole customer for the type, but being the only buyer brought a unique kind of risk. Peter Ingram put it bluntly. There are times when not having a liquid secondary market for an aircraft presents you with challenges if you ever want to grow or shrink your fleet. How much success does a program need to have before you buy it? By 2018, those doubts turned into action. Hawaiian reopened its fleet competition, inviting both Airbus and Boeing to make their best offers. Boeing's response was ruthless. According to industry sources, they offered 10 787 to 9 Dreamliners for about the same price Airbus wanted for 6 A330 to 800s, a discount of more than 50% off the list price. Boeing also agreed to release Hawaiian from three 767 leases early, sweetening the deal even further. The economics were impossible to ignore. More planes, better resale value, and a global support network. The decision landed hard. Hawaiian cancelled its A330-800 order and signed for the Boeing aircraft. Liam News called it hand-to-hand -hand combat by Boeing to kill the A330 in EO before it could gain momentum. The A330-800 survived, but just barely, left with a handful of orders and a reputation as the loneliest widebody in the sky. Profitability for the A330 and EO was never tied to becoming a bestseller. Airbus poured just $2 billion into development, barely a rounding error compared to the $25 billion Boeing spent on the 787. That modest investment set a low bar, with a break-even point around 200 to 250 aircraft. Every delivery after that adds to the bottom line. By 2025, with nearly 470 orders on the books, the program is already making money, even if it lags far behind the Dreamliner's 1,800 sales. The A330-800, meanwhile, stands out as an orphan, just 15 orders, a handful delivered, and almost no market presence. Yet, this was not a blunder. The real strategy hid in plain sight. By keeping the A330neo alive, Airbus forced Boeing to slash 787 prices to win deals, eating into their rivals' profit margins. The A330neo's existence also complicated Boeing's plans for a new mid-market jet, the so-called 797, which remains grounded in PowerPoint slides. Sometimes, survival is the most disruptive move of all, in 2024, something unexpected happened. Airlines that had once brushed off the A330 Neo started signing up in record numbers. Condor placed an order for 16 jets. ITA Airways added 15 more. Starlux, Cebu Pacific, and several others joined in. In just 12 months, the program booked 90 new orders, more than in any previous year. The reason was not a sudden change of heart about the aircraft's technology or prestige. It was pure availability. Boeing's 787 backlog stretched out for years, with new customers facing delivery waits of up to a decade. The A350 was also sold out, leaving airlines desperate for a wide body they could get now. Airbus responded with plans to ramp up A330neo production to five aircraft per month by 2029. For carriers who needed capacity fast, the A330 Neo was no longer a fallback. It was the only real option left. The aircraft that once seemed destined for obscurity was suddenly in demand, 
Not because it had changed, but because the world around it had. Today, the A330neo quietly shapes the market, not by dominating, but by denying Boeing easy victories and keeping options open for airlines. In a world where delivery slots matter more than perfection, sometimes survival is the strategy. The chess game isn't over, and neither is Airbus's influence.